Stanford University. We're going to finish talking about particles and magnetic fields, maybe even a little bit about electric fields too. Electric fields are much easier. Uh, I want to finish that today. And then, for my money, we're sort of finished. But we will meet next time, and um, I'll think of something to talk about. But uh, uh, what's that? Today's a 10th lecture. Oh, today's the 10th lecture? Oh, OK. Well, then, we're, then we won't meet next week, <laughs> unless I don't finish today, which I think I will, because uh, it doesn't seem too hard to do. Let me just quickly review. There are electric and magnetic fields. They're vector fields. They depend on position, and they also have components. They have direction. They have uh, they have direction. They have magnitude, and they depend on where you are. Okay. Electric field is one example. Magnetic field is the one that we're really dealing with now, and um, so we call it B. We put a little arrow on top to indicate that it's a vector. And we say it's a function of position. We can also write it in terms of its components, bi of x. Or we can write that bi of x means bx, by, and bz. All the same things. All right, that's the, uh, that's the magnetic field. And they all depend on position. Now, there's a rule about magnetic fields. Where this rule comes from um, is not apparent at the moment. It's a rule about magnetic fields that's partly an experimental rule, partly also con very consistent with, uh, with um, our general theory of electromagnetism. It is a rule which may break down in the future. It's the rule that there are no sources of the magnetic field, no analogs of charged particles for magnetic fields, no mag magnetic monopoles. As I said, in the future, this may prove to be wrong. Uh, but uh, at least experimentally and within the current framework of theory, it's true that the sources of the magnetic field are zero, and that's the condition that del dot B is equal to zero. If B was a flow of a fluid, it would be saying there are no um, sources of the fluid, no pipe ends uh, sticking out in space where water is flowing away in every direction. All right, so del dot B equals zero. We can call that a constraint on the magnetic field. Not any magnetic field is allowed. Only some magnetic fields are allowed. Those which satisfy del dot B equals zero. Instantly, one other thing for tonight in any case, this does not have to be the case in general. But for our purposes tonight, let's assume that the magnetic field and electric field, if it exists, are not dependent on time. They don't vary. Nothing big or different happens, but just, just, to, just to be uh, definite, time-independent, static, electric, and magnetic fields. All right, now, uh, we want to make sure that when we start thinking about magnetic fields that we satisfy this condition here. It would be nice if we could write it in an automatic way where we didn't have to keep checking whether uh, we are correctly implementing this condition. And one way of doing it, it's the accepted way of doing it, it's the uh, effective way of doing it that works extremely well, is to say that the magnetic field is the curl of something. That something is called the vector, oops, the vector potential. And the reason that we do that is because for any field A, the Divergence of a curl of, is always zero. So what we can say is, look, we don't ever have to check or think about whether the divergence of the magnetic field is zero if instead we replace everywheres B by del cross A. And that introduces the notion of a vector potential. It's automatic. We don't have to think about it. However, it does introduce another element into things. And the other element that it introduces is that the vector potential is not unique. If we start writing our equations in terms of the vector potential, then um, different 
different vector potentials will sometimes correspond to exactly the same physics. And in fact, what's the condition? The condition is that two different vector potentials are the same if they lead to the same magnetic field. What is the freedom in choosing the vector potential? Well, now we use another fact about um, calculus or about vectors and scalar fields, about fields. And it's the fact that the curl of any gradient, the curl of any gradient, del s, is always equal to 0. So that means that if we add a gradient to A, it will not change its curl. That happens to be the only ambiguity. It's possible to prove that there's no other ambiguity in the vector potential other than adding to it the gradient of a scalar. That's the only ambiguity. Any two vector potentials which give rise to the same magnetic field, the difference between them will automatically be a gradient. That's a mathematical theorem. And so we can say that um, the vector potential is ambiguous up to a certain kind of transformation. It's called a gauge transformation. This is called a gauge transformation. As I said, it represents an ambiguity in what the vector potential is. But what about the magnetic field? What happens to the magnetic field when you make a gauge transformation? And of course, the answer is nothing. That's the whole point. And someone says that the magnetic field is gauge invariant. In fact, anything that has real physical measurable significance is gauge invariant. Well, we have an idea that the magnetic field, as well as lots of other things that we might measure directly in the laboratory, are gauge invariant. So we do something a little bit odd. We're going to talk about this more. We do something a little bit odd. We add into the system a new object, the vector potential, at the cost of it. It, it is effective in taking care of this constraint, but it leads to ambiguities of its own. And then we remove those ambiguities by saying the only thing that we're allowed to really think of as physical are those things which are gauge invariant. In other words, those things which uh, really, really only depend on the magnetic field and not on the, uh, on the vector potential itself. That becomes a principle, the principle of gauge invariance. I don't think we have to write down the components of the magnetic field in terms of the derivatives of A. We've done that before. If we need it, we'll come back to it. OK, let's, let's uh, write down an example. Let's write down a particular example, which we'll use later in the evening. It's the example of a uniform magnetic field. Uniform magnetic field pointing in the blackboard. I think I wrote it down last time, but let's write it down again and, uh, and check out some of the things we've been doing. All right, so it's a magnetic field for which Bx is equal to 0. Uh, well, OK, well, now I've forgotten. Bx, no, Bx is equal to B. By, sorry, wrong. Bz is equal to B. Bx is equal to 0. By is equal to 0. It's a magnetic field along the x-axis. Now, of course, it doesn't matter what axis it's along. We can always orient the axis. It's a magnetic field along the z-axis. We can always orient the z-axis so that it's along the magnetic field. And little b is just a constant. 
All right, let's first of all see if we can represent it by a vector potential. The answer is yes, and I'll write down the answer. Uh, here is a vector potential immediately. First of all, we can, the, I'll write down the answer. The answer is that A x, check it out, let me get the sign right, it's, All right, AX is equal to zero, AZ is equal to zero, and AY is equal to BX. Let's check that. The only possible derivative is the derivative of AY with respect to X. That's the only derivative that, doesn't, that isn't zero. Derivative of AY with respect to X, that's not zero. I can subtract off that for free derivative of AX with respect to Y, since that is zero. AX is zero. And this happens to be the Z component of the magnetic field. What is the, AX, the AY by X? It's just B. So that is the Z component of the magnetic field. This works. Okay? But it's not the only thing that can work. Why is it that I've chosen Y and not X, for example, uh, the field is along the z-axis, so it's not surprising that the z component is special. But x and y, they seem sort of symmetric in this problem. Magnetic field into the blackboard. I'm looking at it in the xy plane. Why did I pick out y instead of x? All right, here's another solution. Another solution. ax equals minus by. Ay equals 0. And... AZ is equal to zero again. How about that? In this case, the only derivative is the derivative of AX with respect to Y. This time, there's no DAY with respect to X, but the derivative of AX with respect to Y is minus B. Well, that's good, because there's a minus sign over here. So this is, again, exactly the same magnetic field, BZ equals B. All right, so these must be related, then, by a gauge transformation. Let's see if we can find the gauge transformation that's necessary to relate them, the S. I'm not going to search for it and then find it. I'm going to just write down what the answer is, uh, and we'll check it. All right. I have forgotten the answer, but I know what the answer is proportional to. The answer is proportional to some constant times xy. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with this representation over here. We're going to gauge transform it. What are we going to do? We're going to add to a the gradient of this quantity over here, and we're going to see what we get. All right, so what's the gradient of this quantity? The gradient, the component in the x direction, that's just the derivative of s with respect. This is the gradient, the s. The component of the gradient of a, s in the x direction, that's just c times y. And what about the gradient of s in the y direction? That's c times x. So what happens now? If we add to these, these pre -existing, this pre-existing vector potential, let's erase this for a minute. If we add to this pre-existing vector potential, uh, exactly what's written here. So what happens to AX? AX becomes the original AX, which was 0, plus the gradient of S, that's C times Y. Z, nothing happens to AZ because the gradient of S has no Z, no Z component at all. And finally, this stays zero here. And what happens to this one? We add to it BX plus what? Pl uh, BX plus CX, right? BX plus CX. OK, now what I'm going to do is choose C. I haven't told you what C is yet. C could be anything. I can do many different gauge transformations. 
with different values of c. Let's now choose c, and in particular, I want to choose c to be minus b. Clever, clever, clever. Then this becomes 0. And what happens to this one? It becomes minus b times y. So what I've done is succeeded in going from the gauge, from the, from the ga representation, where the y component is b times x, all other components are 0, to another representation where the x component is minus b times y, and the y component is 0. So they're the same. They're related by gauge transformation. There's a zillion other gauge transformations you can do. Let's see, what else could we do? Uh, we could choose c to be minus 1 half b. Let's see what happens then. c is minus 1 half b. So what happens to this? This becomes b over 2 times x. And what happens to this one? This one becomes minus b over 2 times y. Still, we'll get the same magnetic field. This is a little exercise prove that the magnetic field comes out exactly the same. All right, so these are called gauge transformations. And a particular choice, a particular choice is called a gauge. We could call this the gauge in which AX and AZ are equal to 0. Here's a gauge in which uh, both uh, AX and AY both have the same magnitude but opposite sign. There's a third gauge, which uh, was um, that AY is 0 and AX was minus B over 2 times Y. So these go under the name of different gauges. And the principle that the phenomena, the actual physical phenomena that take place should be independent of the particular gauge, that's called gauge invariance. This is a absolutely central principle in modern physics, so important uh, that um, uh, it, it governs everything. It's, it's big, really big. Yeah? Uh, can you make A have the same symmetry as B? Uh, which is, what symmetry is that? Rotation about the, no. No, no, you can't. Well, you, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't represent the same, uh, the same situation. Right. No, you can't. No, there are limits. Obviously, you can't do anything you want. There are limits. And uh, you could do a lot more than this. This was only one particular C equals C, S equals CXY. That was only one particular thing you could do. There's a lot of other things you could do. I just, uh, I just used that as an example to show you how you can go from one gauge to another. Sometimes uh, you say things like, all right, I'm going to look for a gauge. I think I can prove it. I know I can prove it that there always does exist a gauge in which the x component is equal to 0 of the vector potential. You can prove that. It's not just for a uniform magnetic field. And then you would speak about the gauge in which the x component is equal to 0, or the gauge in which the y component is equal to 0. All right, so that's the lingo. That's the, that's the language of gauge, uh, of gauge theories. Question. The, gate, the gauge transformation always refers to the addition of a, of a I guess, a field in which the gradient is, uh, you arrive at the field by taking the gradient and scale it. Yeah. Well, does it always refer to that? In electrodynamics and in the theory of charged particles, it always refers to that. Uh, then it's a, it's a similar but more complicated structure, which we're not going to get into tonight, obviously. And the choice of coordinates in a, uh, in a, in a gravitating uh, system, the choice of coordinate system that you describe a curved geometry by, is also called a gauge. The, again, it's a choice that you can make, how you coordinateize a curved space, 
But the physics had better not depend. The physical phenomena don't depend on how you, in your um, uh, wisdom, has decided to put coordinates on, uh, on space. So again, that's the notion of gauge invariance. But we're going to be speaking tonight, at least, only about this electromagnetic variety of gauge transformation. And as I think I mentioned last time, I honestly don't, uh, no, I, I, I was going to say, I don't know the origin of the term gauge. I do know the origin of the term gauge. Uh, it was a historical sort of glitch that at one time, for a brief period, people thought it had to do with transforming your units of measurement at different places. They thought somehow this had to do with changing your unit of measurement. And it didn't. It was just a wrong start. Uh, yeah. Question. Um, does it turn out that there are either computational or other kinds of advantages to using one gauge or another? Very often. We'll, we, we'll, uh, let's try to get to one. Uh, yeah. The, oh, yes. That, that, <laughs> that is a very good imp uh, the point. Sometimes this can be a nuisance, but sometimes it can be a positive, distinct advantage because it can happen that certain things, certain things are manifest, in other words, obvious in one gauge and very non-obvious in some other gauge. It might be that this or that property is manifest in one gauge, but that or this property is manifest in another gauge. And so you may use one gauge to study energy conservation and another gauge to study Lorentz invariance. I'm not making that up. I mean, that is the way it works. Uh, yeah. Spaces seem somewhat similar to eigenspaces and finding eigenvalues. Is there any relationship there, or is that just sort of out in the well, of course, everything is related to everything else, but not in any obvious way at this point, no. Um, OK, now let's come to the Lagrangian. We talked about the Lagrangian last time. This is a Lagrangian now for a point particle. It is not the Lagrangian for the electromagnetic field or anything like it. It's just a, a Lagrangian for a particle moving in a static magnetic field. Uh, electric fields are easy. We won't even bother with them tonight. We're just going to do magnetic fields. The Lagrangian, I, we, we, we talked about it last time. We'll just go over quickly again uh, the idea. There's, first of all, the Lagrangian for the free particle, just a kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, 1 half, let's just write m, uh, mv squared. v squared, of course, means the sums of the squares of the time derivatives of x, y, and z. Maybe I'll write them out. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll just write them all out. Just you know, be really concrete about it. x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. OK, that's the Lagrangian for the free particle. If that's all there was, the free particle would just be a free particle, no forces on it. It would just move in straight lines and be dull. All right, what do we add to it? Last time we talked about it, and I'm going to tell you what we add to it. We're not going to derive it from anything. We're going to just. Write it down. It has a numerical coefficient which is proportional to the charge of the particle. It is the charge of the particle. Electric charge measured in some units. Uh, the last time I put a speed of light down here, it's quite obvious that it's only E over C which comes into things. And in different choices of units, E over C is sometimes just called Q or whatever. I've kept the speed of light in some units or other that I'm familiar with and that I use all the time. There's a speed of light downstairs. But you could, of course, just change the definition, get rid of the speed of light, and change the definition of what you mean by the electric charge. It's just multiplying it by a number. I'll leave the E over C in there. It, just, it somehow appeals to me aesthetically. E over C, I like it. I'm used to it times the vector potential dotted into the velocity. This is obviously one thing that I could write down. I could also try writing down things involving the magnetic field. I advise you to try to do that and play with it and see if you can find anything interesting. Find some other way of dealing with, uh, with things and see what you get. But we're not going to do that tonight. So A dot V means, literally, AX times X dot plus AY times Y dot plus AZ times Z dot. 
And what do we want to do with this? All right, I think I showed you last time how you prove that the equations of motion are gauge invariant. I'll just really briefly remind you, you begin with the action principle. You take two points in space and time, and you say, let me find the path which minimizes or otherwise makes stationary the action, which is the integral of the Lagrangian. We have something new. We have something which seems to depend on the vector potentials here in the Lagrangian. And so we have to ask, when we make a gauge transformation, like up on the top there, does it influence the action? If so, we might be in trouble. So, let's, so, so we worked out last time. There's a contribution to the action when you make a gauge transformation. When we make a gauge transformation, there will be a contribution to the action, E over C, times the change in the vector potential. And that's, well, let's, let's write it as uh, the gradient of s times x sub i dot. This is not the full contribution from a times velocity. It's the change that we get when we make a gauge transformation. This is the change in the action coming from a gauge transformation. And the point was that. This is integral what dt, of course. And if you use a little bit of calculus, you'll find that this integral is nothing but e over c times the value of s at, let's call this the final point in space and time. Let's call this the initial point in space and time, s of x final minus x initial. We worked that out last time. How do we see that? This is the x dt. dt over t cancels. And each little piece here is the change in s from going from one point to a neighboring point, and you add them all up, and finally you get the difference in s at the two endpoints. Now, so first, con first conclusion, the action is not gauge invariant. When you do a gauge transformation, the action changes. But does it change in an important way? Does it change in a way which affects the finding of the trajectory, the trajectory which minimizes the action? Now, remember what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep the endpoints fixed. We nail them down. And we explore all trajectories and look for the ones which minimize, or look for the one which minimizes the action. If we keep the endpoints fixed, then when we vary the trajectory around, this doesn't change. And because it doesn't change, finding the minimum doesn't depend on it. So the answer is, although the action itself is not quite gauge invariant, exploring the trajectories, keeping fixed the endpoints, does give rise to a gauge invariant answer. The trajectory which minimizes the action will not depend on a gauge transformation for this reason. All right, so we can be quite certain then. We don't have to check it. We're going to check it anyway. But we don't have to check that the equations of motion that follow from this Lagrangian will be gauge invariant. What does it mean to say they're gauge invariant? Yeah. What, what does it mean to say they're gauge invariant? It means when we work out the equations, the vector potential is going to disappear. And what's going to be in its place? The magnetic field. In other words, the, gauge, the, the, uh, the vector potential is going to come in in, co in combinations which we'll recognize as components of the magnetic field. Okay. All right, so let's do that. Here's our Lagrangian. And I'm going to be really concrete and pedantic about it. What's the first thing we do when we encounter a Lagrangian and we want to work out the equations of motion? Remember, the equations of motion, let's write them down. They're p dot i, where p is what? p is the momentum, is equal to partial of L with respect to xi. Those are the Lagrange equations of motion where, let me remind you what pi is, pi 
is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x sub i dot. In other words, pi is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity. Now, now I have to uh, tell you more about the notion of momentum. There are two notions of momentum. There are two distinct notions of momentum. One of them is just the old-fashioned momentum, mass times velocity. Okay. Mass times velocity. It's called the mechanical momentum. Where should we write it? OK, let's put it over here. MV equals mechanical momentum. It's also the definition you encounter in elementary physics. Mass times velocity is momentum. Here's a different definition. Namely, the derivative of the Lagrangian, sorry, the, deliver, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity, different definition, and it's called the canonical momentum. It's the momentum that you use in Hamilton's equations. It's the momentum that you use uh, throughout our formal construction, the thing that goes into Poisson brackets. Uh, partial of L with respect to the velocity, derivative with respect to the velocity. Are they the same? Well, supposing there's only this term here, and we differentiate L with respect to x dot, what do we get? We get mx dot. So yes, they're the same. Supposing this weren't here, but there was an ordinary potential energy, V of x, or U of x. I forgot what we called it. Maybe we called it U of x. I'll call it U of x a potential energy u of x. u of x doesn't depend on the velocities, the velocity components. So when you differentiate L with respect to x dot, this doesn't contribute. And it's still true that the canonical momentum and the mechanical momentum are the same thing. But with a magnetic field, or in general, in general, they're not the same thing. Okay. Let's see what we get. Here, what is p sub i? P sub i is partial of L with respect, let's take the x component, let's not do i, just x, x dot. That's equal to mx dot, but there's an extra term from here, plus e over c a sub x. That's it. That's the canonical momentum. It is not equal to the mechanical momentum. They are two quite different things. When you're asking whether momentum is conserved by virtue of a symmetry, you're talking about this beast, not this one over here necessarily. They might be the same, but they might not. OK, so there we are. There's our P sub i. And we want to work out the Lagrangian equation. Here it is. P sub i dot is equal to partial of L with respect to x sub i. So let's work it out in detail. OK, first of all, what is p sub i dot? It's just a time derivative of this. And what's that? That's m times the acceleration. That's good. We got the acceleration in. That's where we want to go. We want to get some f equals ma formula. m times the acceleration. But then there's another term, e over c times the time derivative of a of x. Now, a of x is, of course, a function of position. It depends on where the particle is. The particle is moving around. The vector potential varies from place to place. And so at the position of the particle, the vector potential will vary with time, even though there may be no explicit dependence. The, mag the, the field may be completely constant at any given point. Because the particle moves, a changes. So what's the change in a per unit time, the derivative of ax with respect to time? It's changing because the position is changing. Okay. So what do we get? We get derivative of ax with respect to x times x dot plus the derivative of ax with respect to y times y dot plus the derivative of ax with respect to z times z dot. What did I do? 
I just took this AX over here, and I said it changes because the position of the particle changes. It's X changes, it's Y changes, and it's Z change. This is the change in X and change in A, change in AX, because the particle moves. All right, that, that is the left-hand side of the equation. How about the right-hand side of the equation? We still have the right-hand side of the equation, so let's go to the right-hand side of the equation. That is the derivative of L, in this case, let's say a piece of X, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to X. This term here doesn't depend on X at all, only depends on velocities. How about this term? Does this de term depend on x? Well, sure it does. A depends on x. So we get on the right-hand side, e over c times the derivative of ax with respect to x times x dot. Then there's a term from here, plus partial of ay with respect to x times y dot, plus partial of az with respect to x times z dot. All I've done was differentiate each one of these with respect to x. Sorry, where's my, I'm in the wrong place, aren't I? Here's the, the equals should go here. It's the right-hand side of this equation. All right, so let's bring it down where it belongs. The thing in this bracket over here looks a little bit like the thing in this bracket over here, but they're actually quite different if you look at them. The first term is the same. Derivative of ax with respect to x times x dot. Same thing over here. Any, any questions about this? I don't want to go too fast. Yeah. Um, in the Lagrangian, does the second term a What's kinetic it? energy or a potential energy? That's a word. It's neither. So how do you know whether to add it or subtract it? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying let's try it out. Let's just try it out. We could try it out subtracting it too. We can try it out both ways. Okay, we can try it out both ways. Uh, or we could try all kinds of things. Um, I'm short. I'm shortcutting a bit of the work for you, and telling you what the answer is. And now we're going to check the answer. But we, um, subtracting it would only correspond to changing the sign of a. So we just go a to minus a, replace a by minus a. The formulas would be the same, except wherever you would see an a, you would stick a minus a. So it wouldn't make much difference. Uh, all right, so here we are. And at this level, we might as well never have heard of a magnetic field. We've written down some equations of motion. We never heard of a magnetic field. Let's just follow our, uh, let's just follow our noses with this equation and see what we get, pretending we had never heard of the concept of a magnetic field, yeah. The last term should be AX. Yes, you're right, thank you. No, it's AZ, AX, AY, AZ. Yeah, middle one's Y, good. Yeah, okay, now we'll go up to the top. You're differentiating this with respect to x, this with respect to x, and this with respect to x. Okay. On the other hand, the term in the left only has ax's. It only has ax's on the left, and that's because it comes from calculating the time derivative of ax here. See, they come from different places. On the right-hand side, you're getting something that comes from differentiating with respect to x. So you get three different terms, derivative of ax with respect to x, derivative of ay with respect to x, derivative of az with respect to x. On the other hand, on the other side of the equation, you're differentiating p sub x with respect to time. 
So it's always AX, but different velocity components there. OK, that's the, uh, that's the setup. And now let's see what cancels and what doesn't cancel and manipulate it and see what kind of things we get. First of all, the left-hand side contains M and just the A component of the acceleration. Let's call it by a uh, familiar name, the X component of acceleration. Next, certain terms cancel. Let's cancel the ones that cancel. AX with respect to X times X dot. Same thing over here. So let's, I don't want to erase them. I just want to block them out. Whoops, I missed something. I didn't catch X dot here. There. OK. Now, that's equal to, we're going to bring everything over here onto the right-hand side of the equation. We're going to transpose it, which means we have to change the sign. So everything in this bracket is going to go over to the left-hand side. Obviously, there will be an E over C. And let's combine the things that first multiply y dot. Here are two things that multiply y dot. So let's combine them. One of them is partial of ax with respect to y. And what's the other one? Partial of y with respect to x. With a minus sign. Because we take, let's see, did I get it right? Partial? Yeah. Uh, where the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> I think this one comes in with a minus sign, huh? That one went over to the right-hand side, and the other one has a plus sign, D-A-Y with respect to X. Times, I think it's Y dot, Y dot. Oh, boy. It's looking good. We're getting components of the magnetic field, in case that slipped past you. Okay? But then there's another term. Let's put a big bracket around it. And now let's combine the things which multiply z dot. That will be plus partial of a z, oops, a z with respect to x, minus partial of a x with respect to z. Times z dot, huh? Oops, close bracket. And that's it. But we can make it look a little prettier. First of all, what is this? Partial of AZ with respect to X minus partial of AX with respect to Z. It's clearly a component of the magnetic field. Which one? Plus or minus? I'm asking you because I don't know. <laughs> ZX, I think it's BY, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> I have to look up in my notes. It's either plus or minus. And of course, my notes can easily be wrong because I haven't checked them. Let's see. Let's see if I. Uh, MAX equals E over C partial of a Y with respect to X minus partial of AX with respect to Y. Yep, yep, yep. And I have, if, if I'm correct, I have MAX equals E over C times BZ Y dot minus BY Z dot. It's either that or minus that, but I think it's that. OK. So first of all, first lesson to learn is it does something. It creates a force. The right-hand side is not 0, first thing. Second thing, that force is gauge invariant. It does not involve the ambiguity in A. Good. This is also good. And finally, it's whatever it is, it's something whose x component involves the z component of magnetic field and the y component of velocity minus the y component of magnetic field times the z component of velocity. And it sounds awfully much like 
either plus or minus b cross v. All right. If I've done my homework correctly and I didn't make any mistake, then I think it should be e over c, v cross b, and I'm not going to give you enough time to check that because I don't want to know if I'm wrong. Or at least it's the x component of that. Don't tell me if I'm wrong. If, if, you, if, if I'm wrong, just keep it to yourself. I, I don't want to know. Okay. Meaning, it's a worse to sign, and uh, I, signs are not for the blackboard. Okay, what uh, you can do exactly the same thing with the other components, the y component, the z component. And of course, what this is, is it's the Lorentz force law. I call these the Newton Lorentz equations. Uh, mass times acceleration is E over C times V cross B. The side is Newton, the side is Lorentz. So I call them by the name Newton Lorentz equations. And they tell you if you didn't already know it, but you knew more about the vector potential side of things, you would have discovered by this argument that the force, magnetic force, on a charged particle is E over C times V cross B. Oops. Quite an elegant structure in some ways. Even though uh, we had to introduce this thing called the vector potential, which was somewhat ambiguous. Now, it's actually a theorem, and I won't try to prove it, that you cannot express the motion of a charged particle in, in, in an action form, in the form of a Lagrangian equation of motion, without introducing the vector potential. You've got to. You can try just fiddling around with only the magnetic field, and you won't get anywhere. Uh, what would happen if, instead of the vector potential, you substituted in the magnetic field itself? Then every place that you saw the, the uh, every place you see the A field, you would see a B field, and you'd wind up with a thing which was the curl of the B field. <coughs> no, that's not the Lorentz force law. Anyway, uh, all right, are we uh, are we ready for more? All right, let's go on to the Hamiltonian. Next is the Hamiltonian. We're going to plow through this thing and do basically all of charged particle physics tonight in a magnetic field. So the next thing is, is there a Hamiltonian form for this? In other words, is there an expression for energy? And can we use that expression for energy to, um, to use, uh, as a Hamiltonian? Let's first write down, we're going, to need the we're going to need the canonical momenta. So what is it? It's Px is equal to mx dot plus E over C times Ax. Py is equal to my dot plus E over C Ay. Pz is equal to mz dot plus E over C Az. All right, we'll need those. OK, the Hamiltonian. What's the rules for the Hamiltonian in terms of the Lagrangian? So I'll remind you. The Hamiltonian is equal to the sum over all the coordinates of the ith component of momentum times the ith component of velocity minus the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is a function of x and x dot. Now, the Hamiltonian is supposed to be a function of x's and p's. This was really easy in the previous cases because p was essentially just x dot times the mass. So you could just, wherever you saw an x dot, you can just substitute p over m. Well, it's not much harder here. You do the same thing. You just say, I will solve these equations for x dot, and that's easy. Just Let's, um, yeah, let's, let's rewrite them. 
Px minus E over C Ax over M divided by M is equal to x dot. I've just transposed the E over C A to the left and divided by M. That tells me what x dot is. It tells me what x dot is in terms of P and functions of x, well-defined functions of x. So I know what x dot is now. Same thing with y dot and z dot. And I can simply plug it into this Hamiltonian. Uh, it's a little bit of a nuisance. I'm, going, I'm not going to carry it out. It, it's not very hard. It's extremely easy, as a matter of fact. It's just keeping track of a few terms, canceling them out. You've got to keep track of a few terms, canceling them out. Let's see. Let's just remember what's here. In the Lagrangian, all right, let's, let's write it. Uh, let's write it. L of x and x dot. Let's write it in detail. It's equal to, first of all, p sub x, x dot, plus p sub y, y dot, plus p sub z, z dot, minus m over 2, x dot squared, minus m over 2, y dot squared, minus m over 2, z dot squared, and then what have I left out? I've left out the E over C A dot V term. And so that's minus E over C, E over C, A sub X, X dot minus E over C, A sub Y, Y dot, and so forth for Z dot. I don't have room to write it. That's it. So what do you do with this? You take it. And you substitute in, for all the x dots, these expressions over here. It's not very illuminating until you do it. It's not very illuminating, but it is the right thing to do. Could you have guessed the answer? Actually, I don't see how you could easily guess the answer, but the answer is very simple. I'll tell you what it is. It is p sub x minus e over c a sub x squared over twice the mass plus p sub y minus e over c a y squared over twice the mass. And same thing for z. plus pz minus e over c a z squared over 2m. All you do is you take the sums of the squares of these expressions here, well, the ones in the, in the brackets here, and divide by 2m. Does anybody recognize what this is? Well, sure you do. This object up here, if you substitute in x dot for it, what is it? Do you, can you tell what it is? Oh, the connected. It's just one half mv squared. It is just one half mv squared. P minus Ea over C divided by m is x dot. Right? Because it comes in squared, you wind up with a mass in the numerator, and you get x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. It's exactly the same thing you would have written down if there was no magnetic field. But does that mean that the magnetic field has no effect? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. The energy is exactly the same function of the velocities as it was without the magnetic field. But that doesn't tell you very much. That doesn't tell you very much. The Lagrangian itself is different. And the Hamiltonian, when expressed in terms of the momentum and not the velocities, is different. That means when you go to work out the equations of motion, it will be different. We know it is. We're going to get the Lorentz force law on the right-hand side. Nevertheless, the numerical value of the energy is 1 half mv squared. It's conserved. And so that tells you that a particle moving in a magnetic field has a constant speed. The magnetic field does not change 
the speed of it. Does it change the velocity? Yes, because the velocity can change its direction. Does it change the speed? No, it doesn't change the speed. The kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, is conserved. It doesn't change. Therefore, the, vo the velocity, uh, the magnitude of the velocity doesn't change. But still, the magnetic field does something. Do you know why, do you know why the ordinary old-fashioned kinetic energy is conserved? Because the, because the force is perpendicular to the velocity. When the force is perpendicular to the velocity, it's V cross B, when the force is perpendicular to the velocity, it doesn't change the magnitude of the, uh, of the velocity. Any force or any acceleration perpendicular to the direction of velocity doesn't change the magnitude of the velocity. And so it's natural, and it comes out, comes out of the equations, that the energy, 1 half mv squared, is conserved. But it's a different function of the canonical variables, the x's and the p's. And so when you go to use Hamilton's equations, you get different answers. OK, let's take a little break um, for five minutes and think of questions. What I wanted to go through to show you how it works is the motion of a charged particle in a, in a uh, uniform magnetic field. It's simple, it's elegant, and it can be solved. In fact, we'll even do, we'll do a uniform electric and magnetic field, but first let's do a uniform magnetic field. First, let's just look at the equation of motion. Well, OK, let's, of course, we're going to look at the equation of motion. But it's not what I meant to say. Uniform magnetic field pointing in the z direction. There were two gauges that we studied, or that we looked at. One was that a sub x, now, did anybody write it down? I, in both cases, a sub z was equal to 0. OK. Yeah. A z is equal to zero. A x is equal to zero. And a y is equal to zero. Okay. <laughs> we could do that one. That's an interesting one, but it's not uh, not very interesting. Of limited interest, shall we say? Yeah, OK, so let's just plug it in. Let's plug it in and uh, put it in. Should we put it into Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian? Let's see. Um, let's put it into the Lagrangian. Let's put it into the Lagrangian. So here's the Lagrangian. Let's erase everything that we don't need. Now we're being very, very concrete and studying a very particular problem, no electric field, and only one component of the vector potential is not zero, and it has a very definite value. So let's erase everything which is zero. Ax is zero, that gets rid of this term. Az is zero, that gets rid of this term. And what about Ay? That is equal to b times x, is that right? b times x. All right, so we have a term in the Lagrangian which is dependent on x and y dot. Are there any cyclic coordinates? Anybody remember what a cyclic coordinate is? It doesn't appear in the Lagrangian. Because it doesn't appear in the Lagrangian, it means that the Lagrangian doesn't change if you shift that coordinate. All right. That's called a symmetry. So one way of spotting symmetries fast is just to look for cyclic coordinates. And do you see any cyclic coordinates? I see two of them. Y and Z. Y and Z. X appears in the Lagrangian, but not Y and Z. 
So it's quite clear then that if you shift y or you shift z, the Lagrangian doesn't change. It involves y dot, but y dot is not y. y dot is just y. <laughs> y dot is just y dot. All right, so there are two cyclic coordinates. Let's look at the first cyclic coordinate. Oh, oh, all right, here. And also, let's come over to here. Let's come over to here. Uh, a sub x is 0. A sub z is 0. And a sub y is b times x. All right, so which ones did we say were cyclic? I've forgotten. y and z? y and z. So what does that mean about y and z? It means that the corresponding momenta are conserved. Right? If you have a cyclic coordinate, the corresponding momentum is conserved. That's an example of Noether's theorem. That's an example of conservation as a, as a, as a um, consequence of symmetry. What is the symmetry? The symmetry is just shifts of the cyclic coordinate. Since the cyclic coordinate doesn't enter, it doesn't matter if you shift it, if you translate it. OK, so which ones? That means that, um, that in particular, let's start with PZ. PZ is conserved. What does that say about the Z motion? It says that the acceleration of Z is 0. PZ is conserved. That means that z dot, the velocity in the z direction, is conserved. That means the acceleration in the z axis is 0. So first conclusion, PZ dot is equal to 0, or acceleration in the z direction is equal to 0. So as far as the z axis goes, the particle just moves along with uniform velocity down that axis. Excuse me. I, I, I missed why PZ dot is zero. Because Z doesn't, because, OK. Is it a symmetry argument? Yeah. It's a symmetry argument. And it says that the Lagrangian is symmetric under Z goes to Z plus a small shift. Okay. Why, does it, why is it so? Because Z doesn't appear in it altogether. Good. OK, so that's the first thing we see, that, um, uh, that the acceleration in the z direction is equal to 0. Now, what's the other one which is conserved? Y, p sub y. p sub y is conserved. What does that say? Let's take a look at that. Right. p sub y, that says that d by dt of my dot plus e over c b x is equal to 0. Saying something is conserved is just another way of saying its time derivative is equal to 0. I've plugged in for p sub y what it is, and here's what I get. And now let's work that out. That's the mass times the y component of acceleration plus e over c times the magnetic field times the x component of velocity. Let's write it, v sub x equals 0. That's kind of interesting. It doesn't say that the acceleration in the y direction is 0. What it says is that the acceleration in the y direction is equal to minus e over c b over m times vx. This is nothing but the Lorentz force law, incidentally. Mass times acceleration minus some force, which involves the B field, the velocity. This is absolutely nothing but the Lorentz force law for the special case of constant magnetic field. And so it gives rise to this equation over here, a sub y or we can put the m back. Let's put the m up. Let's put the m on this side. Mass times acceleration in the y direction is proportional to the magnetic field times the x component of velocity. What about the x component of uh, what about the x component of um, acceleration? There are two ways we could do it. There are two ways we could do it. The first would not use a conservation law. 
we just work out the x equation of motion. We didn't have to work out the y equation of motion. All we had to do was spot a cyclic coordinate. And what did we get? We got this equation over here. This equation, incidentally, is gauge invariant. There's no memory of, it has the acceleration, it has the velocity, it doesn't have the vector potential in it. It's a real equation about real things. Acceleration you can measure, velocity you can measure. It's a real objective phenomena that the x, that, and that's what it says. Okay, next, what about the x component of acceleration? As I said, you can do it in two ways. The first is just to work out the equation of motion for x, but the other is to be slick and change gauges. We chose a particular gauge which was very good for figuring out what the y motion was doing. Why? Because y didn't appear in the Lagrangian. y didn't appear in the Lagrangian, and so it was a cyclic coordinate, and from that we were able to use momentum conservation, and it gave us a simple answer. What's the trick? The trick is to say, let's use the other gauge. And the other gauge, where is it? The other gauge is az is equal to zero, ax is minus by, and ay is equal to zero. What happens if I do that? Then this changes, it becomes minus, and instead of xy dot, we get x dot y. It just interchanges x and y and puts in an extra minus sign. So now which coordinate is cyclic? In this form, this is a different form, a different gauge, a different coordinate is cyclic. Now it's the x coordinate which is cyclic. And therefore, the x component of momentum is conserved. But the x component of momentum is no longer just mx dot. It's mx dot plus e over c, the minus sign, b times y. Let's get rid of everything else here. The x component of momentum has changed its definition. But, say it again. We have to say canonical momentum, not mechanical. Yeah, we have to take canonical momentum when looking at conservation laws. Right. And now this one is conserved. Guess what that one's going to say? That's going to say mx double dot minus e over c b times y dot is equal to zero. In other words, it's going to say m, I think it's going to be m if we do it right. The x component, I think, is going to be equal to plus e over c b v sub y. I may have lost a sign here someplace. Whenever you go from x to y, there's always a sign change, and that's about all. All right, what is this? This is the other Lorentz force law. Finally, m a sub z is equal to zero. That's, those are the conservation laws, and they really are nothing but, they really just express the Lorentz force law. Nothing more to them than that. But we didn't have to work out the equations of motion. We judiciously chose a, one gauge and used one conservation law, then flipped gauges and said, oh, in this new gauge, something else is a cyclic coordinate, and wrote down the, uh, the corresponding conservation law. All right, let's uh, do a little bit more. Yeah. So the uh, components of momentum, of canonical momentum, are not gauge invariant? They are not. They are not. The components of mechanical momentum are. So canonical momentum is not a real physical. It's not something you measure. Right. It's not something you measure. On the other hand, it is the thing that goes into the formal mathematical machinery. Poisson brackets, uh, Hamilton's equations, um, and, uh, and so forth. So yeah, you pay a price that you've introduced things, which I won't say they're not physical, but they're not directly measurable. You've introduced them into the formalism, uh, and that is a price, but uh, the price is um, definitely worth it since there would be no way to do all this without the uh, vector potential.
That might not be a tragedy in classical physics. In classical physics, you say, oh, who the hell cares about um, Hamilton and Lagrange and all that stuff? Let's just write down the newton lorentz force laws. And that's true. You could. Um, quantum mechanics it would be a true disaster. No way, no way around it. OK, let's, uh, let's study, just, just for fun now, let's study what the motion of a system is in a magnetic field. We, we really don't need this anymore. Now we can just go back to the Lorentz force law. The purpose, we're finished with classical mechanics, with the formal structure of classical mechanics. But since we started in on the motion of particles in a magnetic field, we might as well finish it. Uniform magnetic field, what is the motion? All right, so let's, so let's write it down again. It's mass times acceleration is equal to uh, minus, uh, minus or plus, plus is equal to um, uh, E over C V cross B. All right, now B is into the blackboard, right? B is into the blackboard. And let's think about motion, which uh, we've, we've already seen that not much happens along the z-axis. There's no acceleration along the z-axis. So in particular, if the particle is at rest with respect to z motion, it'll stay that way. Let's just leave it that way. Particles at rest in the z-axis, and it's only moving in the xy plane, then these become equations for x and equations for y. Now, B is along the z-axis. First of all, that means the acceleration is perpendicular to both V and B. The true acceleration, in fact, we could write this just, let's just write it as a vector equation, equals E over C, V cross B. OK, here's the particle moving in the plane, in the xy plane. And this tells us that the acceleration is perpendicular to both b, that means it's in the xy plane, and the velocity. So it tells us that the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. If the velocity is like that, then the acceleration is perpendicular to it, acceleration perpendicular. What about the magnitude of the velocity? Does the magnitude of the velocity change with time? That's one of the conservation laws, conservation of energy. And since the energy came out to be just the good old-fashioned kinetic energy, the velocity is constant. So the particle moves along here with a uniform velocity. It has a force perpendicular to it. And what's the magnitude of the force perpendicular to it? Well, the B field is constant with respect to everything. It's just pointing in the z-axis. Okay. The magnitude of the velocity is constant. Therefore, the magnitude of V cross B is constant. It's moving in the xy plane with a constant speed. B is in the perpendicular direction. It means that the magnitude of the acceleration is constant. So the magnitude of the acceleration is constant, perpendicular to the velocity. What's the solution of a particle moving so that its acceleration is always perpendicular to its velocity and constant. Circle. Moves in a circle. It moves in a circle. And let's see what we can find out about that circle. Um, if a particle moves in a circle with velocity v and radius r, then its acceleration is v squared over r. The magnitude of the acceleration is v squared over r. The mass times v squared over r is the mass times the magnitude of the acceleration. And that's equal to e, the magnitude of the velocity, times the magnitude of the, uh, of the magnetic field. Just the magnitude of v cross b is just the magnitude of the velocity times the magnitude of the field. So now we can cancel out one power of velocity. And what we have is a relationship between the radius of the orbit and its velocity. Whatever the velocity of the orbit is, the radius is given by mv over eb 
is equal to the radius of the orbit. So now we know everything. We know it moves. What about the center? Where is, uh, when I say it's moving in a circular orbit, where's the center of that orbit? Nothing I said determined the center of that orbit. There's an orbit of this type moving about any center. Wherever you are, there's an orbit which circulates around that point. So there's an infinite number of circular orbits characterized either, well, first of all, by their position, the position of the center, and next by their, um, the magnitude of the velocity or the magnitude of the radius, one or the other. So every place you can go on a plane, there could be an electron moving in a circle. Some big circles, some small circles. The bigger the circle, the larger the velocity, or the bigger the velocity, the larger the circle. And there's a lot of orbits, a lot of orbits, but they're all circular. And this is what you get. Let's add one more thing, just for fun. Let's add an electric field. Let's add an electric field and see what we can find out. Let's write down. We dropped a C in there. If we put the C back. Yeah, where does the C go? You're right. Go on the right side. C times velocity. That's weird, isn't it? Did I do that right? Well, it is E over C. Let's see. Okay, let's think about it. Um, the bigger the electric charge, let's see, the bigger the electric charge, the smaller the orbit. Large electric charge means tight orbit, so E does go in the bottom. And if E goes in the bottom, then C goes on the top. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so now we know all about charged particles. Incidentally, um, okay, that's, a, that's enough. So the B doesn't do any work on it. Hmm? The B field doesn't do any work on it because the force is always at right Perpendicular, angles. always at right angles, right. Quick question. When, when you first wrote down that Lagrangian, um, it went by kind of fast. That right hand part with, uh, had to do with the magnetic field. Did you just say, I happen to know the answer, I'm going to write it down? And, uh, see which, which, for which part of it? The vector potential. For the, the vector potential. You mean the original A dot V? Yeah. 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 Um, well, it depends on where you want to start. Um, you, could st you could start here. You could start here and say, here is a thing we could add to a Lagrangian. Let's investigate what it does. All right, let's, let's imagine we did that. We said, look. We have these x dot squared terms in Lagrangian. Uh, let's see what happens. Let's explore the possibility that we add to the Lagrangian something involving an, a field A of x dot velocity. Let's explore it. Right. The first thing we would discover if we made that argument about, we, we, we would quickly discover, I don't know how quickly we would discover it, but we would discover that the equations of motion are gauge invariant. We would discover that from the argument that the action doesn't respond to a addition of a gradient to A, we, or it responds but only at the endpoints, we would discover the interesting fact that the equations of motion would be invariant under a gauge transformation. Right? Interesting fact, put it in your hat and we'll uh, come back to it. But then we would just go through the analysis of the equations of motion and come and derive the Lorentz force law. If we never heard of the Lorentz force law, we would say, ah, here's a new thing. Here's a new way that particles can move. So that would be one starting point. Just write it down. Another starting point might be some conviction that for some reason um, there should be a notion of gauge invariance and uh, that um, and that the Lagrangian we should write down should be gauge invariant. That would be a very modern point of view, but the reason that point of view came about is because of so many experiences having discovered things the long way and discovering, oh, there's this principle of gauge invariance. So now when you write down a Lagrangian, the first thing you do is you make sure it's gauge invariant. Um, may not be terribly satisfying to you. Or you can simply start with the Lorentz force law and say, let's look for an action principle. Now, 
Um, that we could have done it that way. It would. Why didn't I? Uh, it's a little harder. That's all. It's just a little harder to make prove the theorem that you have to introduce the vector potential. But uh, it's hard to make sure I remember where we went to some Yeah. Well, we started. We started by saying, let's just try this out. Let's see what it does. Let's. You know, the whole thing could have been reversed. We could have said, let's try this out. We would have discovered the equation of motion involved this funny thing called dA by dx minus dA by dx times x dots. We would have discovered that. We might have said, let's give this thing a name. Let's call it B, since it's the only thing that really does come into the force law. And we would have discovered the magnetic field. That's one line of logic. Historically, of course, it didn't happen that way. But it could have happened that somebody just sat down and said, let's explore this kind of term in the action. Uh, do we need to do something to show that what we're considering as a possible Lagrangian is legitimate, that it obeys whatever constraints? Well, the, that raises the question of what are the constraints on a Lagrangian that it is. Um, and the usual answer is everything is OK as long as you can derive a Hamiltonian, a unique Hamiltonian. Now, that always involves solving for the velocities in terms of the momenta. Remember, we have to solve for the x dots in terms of the momenta. And sometimes you get equations that don't have unique solutions. Then you're in, bad, then you're in hot water. Uh, but. Um, Yeah, it's a legitimate question. What are, the, what are the legitimate Lagrangians? And they're basically those that lead to a sensible Hamiltonian and that don't lead to ambiguities in the equations. Yeah? Should this be v squared in this equation? Uh, I don't remember. We canceled out of v. Oh, we canceled out of v. We had a v squared on this side, and we had a v on this side. Yeah. Does the symmetry under uh, gauge transformation give us the conserved quantities? Not at this point. Eventually, yes. In classical mechanics? In classical electrodynamics. Yeah. But it's a conserved, <laughs> it's a sort of, it's a conserved quantity that we knew anyway, but uh, let's not try to <laughs> go for that now. Um, it gives, us a, it gives a conserved quantity, but um, only when you include into the dynamics the equations of motion of the vector potential itself. And that, that's already um, yeah, beyond us for now. Maxwell's equation. Yeah, I was going to just ask, how does all of this relate to Maxwell? Well, it doesn't. In order to make it relate to Maxwell's equations, we have to add to the action the things which generate Maxwell's equations. This has just got to do with a fixed given electric and magnetic field. How do particles move? Now we can ask, all right, but now let's ask how the electromagnetic field itself changes with time. And that involves adding additional things to the Lagrangian that have to do with the dynamics of the electromagnetic field. That I was going to teach next quarter, but it looks like we're putting it off for a quarter, at least a quarter. Um, there is an action for the electromagnetic field, and uh, it satisfies the principle of least action. This is, one, uh, the, this is one of the terms in it, A times dx, but it has more. The more doesn't involve the coordinates or the velocities of the particles. So when you're studying the motion of the particles and their equations of motion, the rest of it doesn't matter. Well, you couldn't write them down. Uh, you, then if del dot b were not equal to 0, then you couldn't express b in terms of a vector potential. And if you couldn't express b in terms of a vector potential, you couldn't have written any of this down. But you could have said, I don't care. I'm just going to write down the Lorentz forces. And that's OK. You can do that. You can say, I don't care whether the whole thing comes from a Lagrangian or not. I'm just going to write down that MA is equal to E over C V cross B. 
And hell or high water, that's, uh, that's my rule, and it's a perfectly good rule. It's a perfectly good uh, equation of motion. It does not follow from a Lagrangian if unless, uh, unless B is, um, uh, comes from a vector potential, but you say, who cares? Um, the answer is you would have a lot of trouble with quantum mechanics, but uh, that's enough for another time. Yeah. This might be for another time as well, but since you said magnetic monopoles are likely to actually exist, or maybe expected. What's that? Let's say it again. You said that the non-existence of mag magnetic monopoles is yeah. thought to probably be wrong. Um, can we rescue this, you know, in the presence of monopoles? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. Um, The magnetic monopole is the north end of a magnet, or the south end of a magnet. There's always another end there. They always cancel. But if you had a very, very long magnet, and you took the south pole end of it and stuck it off on Alpha Centauri somewhere and just waved around uh, the north pole of it, and if the magnet, the bar magnet, or the whatever it was, was sufficiently skinny and thin so that you couldn't see it, Maybe it was so thin that it would pass right between the molecules in your body uh, without uh, harming them. You could wave this thing around and say, look, I got a magnetic monopole. So that's a kind of existence proof in a sense. There's, there's nothing wrong with that from the point of view of fundamental principles that you have an extremely skinny uh, uh, bar magnet, so skinny that nobody can see it and so skinny that, uh, that it can pass between uh, the atoms of your body. It doesn't violate in anything in classical physics anyway. So you take a very long bar magnet. Now that bar magnet really does have, or it could be a solenoid. It could be a solenoid. A solenoid is a, uh, is, you know, wires going around with current flowing in them. And the magnetic field comes out just as if this were a magnetic monopole. But if you look really carefully, you would discover there was also a magnetic field in here. So it goes in here and out here. Well, if this <coughs> solenoid is really, really thin, uh, perhaps it doesn't affect uh, the motion of particles and so forth, unless a particle by accident just happens to pass through the solenoid, which may be an extremely improbable thing if the solenoid is thin enough then you've manufactured yourself a monopole. Mm -hmm. The magnetic flux density in the, in the solenoid of the bar magnet is, of course, infinite. Yeah. That's kind of a... No, 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 actually. Yeah, no. Um, that, that, of course, is the objection. But so what? So there's an infinite magnetic field in there. What, what, what's, the next, what's the next statement? The next statement is that there's an infinite energy density. Good, that right. Right, right. So supposing I were to tell you that the wires of the solenoid have negative energy, just enough to cancel that out. <laughs> oh, but besides, what do you care if it has infinite energy? It's just an invisible thing with infinite energy. So it's got an infinite energy, so what? You say it's hard to move then, right? Well, well, you just need somebody very strong. No, it, it uh, it, uh, you're asking a serious question. The answer really turns out to be much more interesting. The answer is in quantum mechanics that the energy is actually a periodic function of the magnetic field. And if you put in the right quantum of magnetic field through here, then it's truly invisible and it doesn't cost any energy. Quantum particles do have a magnetic moment. Hmm? Magnetic moments, but not magnetic uh, monopoles. Point particles have magnetic moments, but bar ma magnetic dipoles, but so, <laughs> so do ma bar magnets. A, di a dipole is not a monopole. A monopole means one pole. A dipole means an equal and opposite pair of poles. Right, it's very difficult to distinguish. <laughs> <laughs> 
having a north pole and a south pole with nothing in between them and having a north pole and a south pole with a very skinny bar magnet between them. Um, so, but it's kind of interesting. Supposing you tried to separate the north pole from the south pole, so you uh, take a scissor and cut the solenoid connecting them, north pole, south pole, and then move the north pole far away and the south pole far away. Unfortunately, the place where you cut it develops a north pole, and the place where you cut it over here, north pole, north pole, south pole. So you just make a pair of magnets. You don't make a magnetic monopole. Without breaking it, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I say I don't need to stretch it to infinity to fool you into thinking there's a magnetic monopole over here. I just take this thing, I put the rest of it in my back pocket, and I say, look, here's a magnetic monopole, guys. Look, I got one. <laughs> at, at the risk of violating what you said earlier on, the analogy would be the same as quarks and anti-quarks, right? Quarks and anti-quarks confined by, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, right. Exactly, same phenomenon, right, same phenomenon, or a very similar phenomenon, right. Um, so I didn't want to get into magnetic monopoles, I, th I thought it would make the story simple. In classical electrodynamics, without worrying about the subtleties of monopoles and so forth, uh, one of Maxwell's equations, this is one of Maxwell's equations, del dot b equals zero. If you start mucking around with this, it's possible to, uh, to rescue the situation, but new physics has to go into it, such as, such as um, solenoids with negative energy to cancel out your infinite, uh, your infinite energy. So some new physics has to come in, and that new physics uh, is not built into ordinary electrodynamics. So in ordinary electrodynamics, there you're perfectly right that there's a magnetic field in there, uh, a certain magnetic flux. You've squeezed it down to a very, very thin solenoid that increases the magnetic field. And in fact, it increases the field energy in there. E equals mc squared. So among other things, you've increased the mass of that, uh, that solenoid. And uh, you really can't uh, uh, get away with that. But new physics comes into play when this thing shrinks down to sufficiently small size. That new physics could involve all sorts of new things about elementary particle physics, and it does. And those new things change the picture and, in fact, make the energy to be a periodic function of the magnetic field. So that if you make the magnetic field or if, if you, uh, the magnetic flux, so if you make the magnetic flux through there big enough, all of a sudden the energy returns to zero. But that's, as I said, lots of new physics goes in there. Things like superconductivity? Um, no. Why so? No, 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 no. I mean, this is, uh, this is um, way beyond, uh, this is uh, particle physics of a very high energy kind that would take to do that. Magnet magnetic monopoles, if they exist, are expected to be associated with physics at enormously high energy scales and not uh, something we're likely to see in the foreseeable future. On the other hand, every good theory that I know of of elementary particles has magnetic monopoles in it. So they're probably part of the story, but they're not part of classical electrodynamics. One more question, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've read that Hamilton spent a lot of his years uh, working with some strange numbers called uh, quaternions, and there's the they're now called, they're now called, yeah. That sort of thing. How, how did they fit into this whole theory? Um, no, they were a separate issue, really. I'll tell you what, what his idea was. 
I've, I think I've showed you many times how powerful complex numbers are in keeping track of uh, rotations and things like that of the plane. And they're almost completely useless for keeping track of rotations and things in three dimensions. Um, Hamilton wanted to invent a formalism where there was similar, a similar structure for three-dimensional space. So he said, instead of having one imaginary number, and in fact, what he wound up with, maybe not so happily, I don't know, was a theory of four-dimensional space. But he said, let's, uh, let's add, instead of having only one imaginary number, where i squared is equal to minus 1, he introduced three of them, i, j, and k, one for each axis of, uh, of space. This is sort of like thinking of the imaginary number as associated with the vertical axis. And then there was a fourth axis. The fourth axis was for the real numbers, 1. And uh, then you just start writing numbers, uh, constant times i plus another constant times j plus another constant times k. You have some rules about multiplication, i times j equals k, and cyclic permutations of it. And it, 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 uh, it works very well. It's, it's got another name now. It's called um, Pauli matrices. The Pauli matrices of uh, quantum mechanics are the quaternions. But, uh, but that it really didn't have much to do with his other speculations about, or his other work on mechanics. It was a separate issue. The big, long bar magnet you discussed the North Pole and the South Pole would behave the same way as the North Pole? What's that again? Yeah, except it has the opposite magnetic charge. It's like a plus charge and a minus charge, except magnetic instead of electric. Yeah. Right. And if you bring them together and touch them together, they just disappear. It's like taking the north pole of a magnet and the south pole and bringing them together. There's no, mag uh, no, uh, no poles left anymore. Not, a, not there, anyways. OK. You hoped at some point you might go into chaos, at least with respect to phase space. Yeah, well, I guess we ran out of time, didn't we? Yeah. So I guess, uh, yeah, it's the one thing I would have done had we had another, another week or so. But, um, that's all right. You've got the material now. You can go and um, it's all orbits in phase space, orbits in phase space. Okay, let's uh, let's quit. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.